Lord, thank you for being here with us. We ask your blessing this morning on your word and help our hearts to be focused. I pray for uh, minimal distractions as we are at home. Father, we know that can be a problem. We just ask you to help us to listen to what you're saying to us and tune in. Thank you again for this opportunity we have to be able to gather around your word and with you and with one another, maybe not physically, but in spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're going to be in the book of Acts, the 10th chapter. If you are joining us for the first time, we appreciate you being here. We're glad that you're joining us. We are going through a couple of chapters normally on Wednesday nights and then on Sunday morning looking at a smaller passage. So we encourage you to tune in on Wednesday nights. We are live streaming it. If you miss that or have problems connecting, you can always go down and download the message, listen to it on our website. We're also putting it on Facebook and we're working on putting it uh, live streaming on YouTube. So we hope that it'll be available soon to that. So look in the 10th chapter, if you will. Chapter 10, what we're going to look at this morning is Peter's message to Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, verses 34 through 43, Peter's message to Cornelius. If you remember in our study of the book of Acts, in the second chapter, Peter got up and he preached the gospel to all the Jews that were there listening, and of course, many got saved. And then in this passage too, as he went to Cornelius, This was really God working through the Jews into the Gentile areas. Peter went into a Gentile's house, that was Cornelius, and he preached the gospel to him. And so we're going to look at this morning is the message that Peter preached. Now I want to mention that the gospel itself, there's some basic principles in every gospel message we see. Nevertheless, there are some differences as we look at this, uh, sort of nuances. And so I felt like as we look at our, our study, chapters 10 and 11 from Wednesday night, This is on my heart. I'm hoping that a lot of individuals maybe are connecting with us that may not be saved or maybe just looking and tuning in, figuring out what's going on in the church. So we appreciate you continue to reach out and encourage your friends. Let me just mention right now, you may want to take a moment on your phones and message somebody and encourage them to tune in to uh, ccgunet.com and join, join this live streaming. We hope they can connect with us. So do that. If not, hopefully they'll be able to see it and download it later on. But just reach out. Matter of fact, normally what we do is we'll say hey to somebody. So I might want you to say hey to two or three people via your phones by messaging them. That would be sort of cool. We did that again on Wednesday night. So Acts chapter 10, verses 34 through 43. Let me mention there's actually three parts of the message that Peter preached. We'll look at the fact that he's focusing on the fact that Jesus rose from the dead, verses 34 through 41, and that Jesus Christ is the judge of both the living and the dead in verse 42. And then in verse 43, Jesus is the only one that can deal with our sins. And what I want to do this morning is look at this message in light of really what the Bible clearly lays out in front of us, and that is one day we'll stand before the judge and give an account of our lives. I want you to consider the, the idea that maybe you have broken the law. Think about different crimes. There may be uh, serious crimes, uh, and so there may be some that are not so serious, misdemeanors, and uh, there are others that are felonies. Felonies are very serious crimes. I want to point out that we have committed felonies, and felonies are very serious crimes in God's Word, and those are basically the Ten Commandments. And so what's going to happen is we're going to be brought before the judge and give an account of the breaking of those laws. So, and this is real. This is far more real than the physical. Uh, sometimes a person can escape crimes on this planet in our country, but you certainly can't escape the crimes that we commit regarding the breaking of God's law. And we'll look at the end of our study, what Jesus did in order to deal with that so that we won't have to be hauled into a courtroom and then prosecuted, our prosecuting att- attorney, if you will, is actually the law. The law of God is what convicts us, convinces us, that nails us. The Bible says that sin is the transgression of the law. So we're going to look at that in light of our study of Peter's message because it really fits perfectly with the truth, and that is you and I have broken God's law. First of all, verses 34 through 41, we're going to look at that. Let's read this together. Starting in verse 34, then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth truth I perceive that God shows no partiality, 
But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. And this is, of course, the revelation God gave to Peter on our study Wednesday night regarding the fact that now God's opening a door into the Gentile areas. He's actually in a Gentile's home, which was really against the Jewish law, not God's law. But the Jewish law forbade a Jew to go into a Gentile's home. And Peter's there because God showed him that God is a not res- no respecter person. So in verse 36, the word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word you know which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all these things which God did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging in the him on a tree. Verse 40, him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly. Made that very clear in verse 40. In verse 41 says, not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before by God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. I want to point out in our study, chapters 2, 3, 4, 5, every, all those chapters, there's this proclamation of the resurrection. It is a primary focus of the early church and should be in our own personal lives. There is a resurrection. Jesus Christ is alive. As a matter of fact, I spoke with him this morning. We just spoke with him a minute ago when we bowed our heads and asked the Lord to bless this. So as a Christian, we interact with Jesus. We have a personal relationship with him. We are testifying that he's not dead. He's very much alive. And that is a very important part of the gospel, that the resurrection, not only does it mention the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but it gives the fact that all of us individually will also one day be resurrected. I just want to point out in the many lives or many minds of people They just ignore this. They act like and live like this life is all there is. I'm reminded of an Old Testament verse that says, Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. And that is that idea that let's just live it up while we can because one day we're going to cease to exist. And that's what they say when they mention the fact we're going to die. Well, the Bible is very clear. We won't cease to exist. There is a resurrection. So this preaching of the resurrection was um, an important part, that Jesus Christ was alive. That again, the whole idea of the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed of God. And Peter mentions that in his message. This was the individual that God the Father anointed. And as he began his ministry at John's baptism until the time of his death, he was anointed by the Holy Spirit, did many awesome works, preached the gospel, ministered to people, raised the dead, cast out demons, demonstrated his authority. Over sickness, over disease, over Satan and all of his demons. And he's very much alive. In other words, this is the one that Peter's going to say in a minute, we'll stand before and give an account. I'm reminded of a lot of people. I think about the women that came to the tomb on resurrection. We call it Resurrection Sunday. I want to point out they came with spices to anoint his body. They thought he was still in the grave. The point being is that many people simply memorialize a dead person. I think that's why a lot of people make their yearly trek to church on Easter Sunday or maybe Christmas Eve. They're sort of memorializing his birth, memorializing his death, remembering it. But we worship the Lord all the time because he's alive. He's not dead. This is a very important point of the preaching of the gospel. He is alive And if you're a believer, you have a relationship with him. You talk to him. You can testify. You can witness that he is alive. I have met him. Jesus Christ changed my life. Jesus Christ saved me from sin and the penalty of sin by dying on the cross. The idea of a personal reconciliation or relationship with this individual is so important. So the fact of the matter is, as Peter goes into Cornelius' house, he begins to tell Cornelius and all the people that were gathered with him, his friends and his relatives, that this Jesus that you've heard about, but of course Cornelius had heard 
about Christ, about the fact, just like a lot of people, they hear about Jesus, and yet they don't have any clue who he really is. Peter is saying that he's alive. And that statement that he's alive simply tells us that we can have a relationship with him. There is a resurrection. This also speaks to us about one day we will be resurrected. One day you will be in another place besides your home. You will be standing before the God of all the earth. This is just a fact. I want you to consider for a moment how many people actually consider and think about that. So the preaching of the gospel in some ways, particularly this idea that he's alive and has been resurrected and that we one day will be resurrected brings this home to us, which simply means that part of the gospel is to get people to think beyond this life, to get people to consider what's going to happen after they die physically, because their soul, the Bible is very clear, will continue on in another place. This has everything to do with the resurrection. That's why the resurrection was a major part of the preaching of these New Testament believers. Remember, the book of Acts is our model for the church. The book of Acts is what we look at and say, all right, what did the church do? What did they say? How did they act? Well, they went around preaching about the resurrection that Jesus Christ is alive. And, of course, that has a lot to do with a personal resurrection of every individual. It's all connected. So we don't cease to exist. We're not just buried or cremated someplace and we cease to exist. But most people live as if that's true. A lot of people don't consider these things. That's why the idea of a resurrection, the truth of the resurrection, has got to be a part of our preaching That individuals can't just bury their head in the sand and pretend as if this life is all there is. That's one of the reasons, as believers, we make a decision. We make a decision about Christ. It's because we don't believe this is all there is. It's not all that we see around us. There's much more than what we see around us. The Bible talks about this natural world one day being dissolved. The heavens being dissolved and a new heavens and new earth being created because there is a life after this. And again, one of the problems that many people in our world have, they never really consider and think about that. That is the reason Peter and the disciples preached about the resurrection. They wanted people to consider these things and particularly the fact that Jesus Christ was alive because what Peter is fixing to say about Jesus is very relevant to every human being on the planet. Remember that. In your personal proclamation, Jesus Christ is alive. And again, he has changed my life. This was not some psychological, mental thing. He changed my life. He transformed me. The new birth or being saved or converted or becoming a Christian is a radical transformation because we have come into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ who is alive. So every believer, as they go into their neighborhoods, their homes, even across whatever you're communicating with, your Facebook or your messaging or however you're calling people, needs to be testifying that Jesus Christ is alive. Because people don't often think about that. And we want people to think about that because it's very important to them personally. Secondly, look if we will in verse 42. This individual who is alive is also the judge of both the living and the dead. So Peter says, verse 42, and he commanded us to preach to the people. Or to proclaim, or the Greek word is herald, to herald to the people. Uh, what they would do when they would send out uh, maybe news in the, in the Roman Empire, they would have heralds that would come into the city, runners that would run into the city, 
and stand on the public square and then herald the news and then go somewhere else. That was how the news was spread. We are to proclaim. We are to herald. We are to declare these things. So in verse 42 again, he commanded us to preach to the people or to herald to the people. Now let me stop for a moment. I wanted to say this. I think there's so little of that going on today. Now certainly from pulpits, hopefully, at least some pulpits, the gospel is being preached. But so many believers never really share with non-believers. It is a major issue in the church. We don't talk about it very much. But I want you to consider, the Bible talks about the, the, the people that were gathered in the first church in Jerusalem. The Bible says when, when Paul began to persecute them, they were sc scattered everywhere preaching the word. What we have seen in our study of the book of Acts is they're going to different places. Philip went down to Samaria and preached the word. A eunuch was saved from the queen of Ethiopia. He was the, the main uh, treasurer. And he went back and he preached the word. They were sharing the word. And the point being is that in the 16th chapter of Mark's gospel, we are told to go in every place and preach the gospel to every creature. So let me encourage you, let me challenge you. When is the last time you preached the gospel, you shared the word? This is a major part of what it means to follow Jesus. So verse 42, he commanded us to do what? Preach to the people. And I would say that he has commanded you. He has commanded me. The Great Commission is a command, not a suggestion. You've heard people say that. It's not a suggestion. This is a, a, a command by God, go to all the world and preach the gospel to who? To every creature, to every person. It is a command from God. So please do that. I want to mention again that we put together an evangelistic video that we put on our website that you can take and share. Send it to your friends. Send it to people you know. Send it to people you don't know. Connect it to the Facebook page. So that all your, your friends are able to download. You can. I don't, I'm not technically oriented, but I'm assuming you can do that. The point being is that we are commanded, and sometimes we can't physically go. But with the technology that we have today, we can take a message like this message or our Easter uh, Sunday message, and we can send that to other people and ask them to look at that. We can take the message that we taught about just the simple gospel. We did that when this corona virus started shutting everything down we did that because we thought wow what an opportunity when people are in their homes and there's not a whole lot to do first of all for us as believers we can take time to begin to do something and get the gospel out secondly a lot of people are stuck at home and as we just talked about they don't think about eternity they don't think about what's going to happen after this life and a lot of people are because of the danger of perhaps dying, or a lot of people know someone who has had the coronavirus or has it, and it just brings it home. And since they're home, what an opportunity that we can have to send that video to somebody and say, please look at this, or put it on your Facebook. Let people see it. So again, verse 42, he commanded us to preach to the people. And then here's the second point I want to make regarding the message that Jesus Christ is the judge of both the living and the dead. Verse 42, he, to him, the, excuse me, verse 42, he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it is, it is he, Jesus, who was ordained by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. So he's the judge. The Bible says he's the judge of all the earth. Let me say it another way. Everybody has a date in court before the judge. And that's sort of the scenario I want to set before you. There is a judge. This individual who's the judge was at one point dead, but now he's been resurrected. God the Father has appointed Jesus to be the judge of both the living and the dead. Please remember that. All of us. Have a date in court. The Bible says in uh, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, 
as it's appointed to men once to die, but after this, the judgment. There's an appointment you have with death. There's an appointment that I have with death, and that is when God has determined that we would die. There's an appointment that you have with death, physical death, but there's also an appointment standing before the judge. Who is the judge? The judge is this individual that Peter is preaching to Cornelius. His name is Jesus. He came the first time as the Lamb of God. We've talked about this. He's coming the second time as the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the judge of the whole earth, both the living and the dead. Very important. important. Acts chapter 17, I'm going to read this verse, but you're close enough, you may want to flip over there. Acts chapter 17, verse 31 and again, Peter, or Paul rather, was preaching in this passage. Here's what he says. He, speaking of the Father, has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man, that's capital M, whom he has ordained. Speaking of Jesus. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Simply meaning that the resurrection is the assurance that you and I have that this individual that God the Father has appointed as the judge will be the judge of who? Both the living and the dead, meaning every single person. Very important point in Scripture. Turn, if you will, to Revelation chapter 20. Last book in the Bible, Revelation chapter 20. And I just want to read this section because it deals with this great judgment now, there are actually two judgments primarily in the Scriptures. One is for the lost. Every unbeliever will stand before God at the great white throne judgment. And that's what we're going to read in a minute. But every believer, every follower of Christ will also stand before Jesus and be judged how we followed Him. Everyone will get to heaven that is a believer, but we will also stand before the judge. Very important for believers to remember that. And for non-believers to recognize what I'm fixing to read. So in Acts, excuse me, Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. Here's what it says. Then I saw a great white throne. That's why it's called the great white throne judgment. And him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. Now, who is this person? Well, let's keep reading here. And I saw the dead, small and great, Standing before God, and the books were open. Who is this individual called God? Well, that is obviously Jesus Christ, God the Son. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which are written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one, according to his works. And death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the first death being physical, the physical death, the second death being a separation by God into the lake of fire for eternity. So in verse 50, 15 says, anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That is the second death. Or that is ultimately the a permanent separation for, for individuals who don't know the Lord. So here's the point. You have a date in court before the judge. You have broken the law. Those that have died are really in holding. It's almost like they got locked up. They're awaiting their being brought before the judge and sentenced. They've not yet been sentenced. The 20th chapter of Revelation is the sentencing of every non-believer, every unsaved person on the planet. So in this passage, in verse 42, as Peter's preaching in Acts, he's making the statement that Jesus Christ is the judge both of the living and the dead. Now the question is, who is our prosecuting attorney? Who is the one that's going to prosecute us? Or bring, bring us before the judge and prove that we've sinned. Well, the prosecuting attorney for that judgment is the law. The law is our prosecuting attorney. 
We read in, on Easter Sunday, I believe, the passage in the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians that says the strength of sin is the law. Simply meaning that what makes sin so powerful or so strong is the law. What makes the, the case so strong against us or against non-believers, I should say, as they come before the judge is the prosecuting attorney. The prosecuting attorney is the law. In other words, that's why the books are open. The books are open there in that 20th chapter of Revelation And it's recorded every time you or I have broken the law of God and sinned before Jesus, before a holy God. That is our prosecutor. Paul the Apostle said, I had not known sin, but by the law. The Bible says, Paul said in another place, when the commandment came, sin revived or revealed sin and I died. In other words, I realize I'm a dead person. You're on death row. You're waiting for the judgment to fall. If a person's died, they're sitting on death row. I want to mention that all of these sins, all ten of the great ten commandments, are felony offenses. They're not misdemeanors. They're punishable by death. There's no escape. There's no way you can get out of that. And Peter's making it very clear as he's preaching to Cornelius. That this individual called Jesus is very much alive, and one day, Cornelius, everybody's going to stand before him and give an account of their lives. You have a date. You have a date before the judge in heaven. That judge, unfortunately, to a lot of unbelievers, and back in these days, is the very one they rejected and persecuted and hated. That's a pretty terrifying thought. Suppose you had a personal grudge against the judge. And, 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 and all of a sudden you realize, I'm going to be brought. I've done something wrong. I've, I've, I've broken the law. I've got a date before the judge. I'm hauled. And this is the guy that I have offended all my life and hated and despised. That's what it's going to be like. And everything's recorded. This is what the Bible says in the 20th chapter of Revelation. It's all recorded for us. So he is the prosecuting attorney. And there's this appointment that everybody has with death and with the judge. Because it's Jesus Christ. Now look at verse 43. Verse 43 is the great news. Before I read that, let me just mention or quote a verse that Jesus said regarding this event. He says, agree with your adversary while you're in the way. Lest your adversary deliver you to the judge and the judge deliver you into the prison He says, you'll be kept there and you'll stay there until you've paid the very last dime you owe. What Jesus said was, agree with your adversary while you are in the way. That's what Peter is saying to Cornelius. Jesus is alive. He's the judge. And you better make it right with him while you have an opportunity. You better clear up this record of all your sins. Well, how do I do that? Well, look in verse 43. It says, To him all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. The judge is the one who sets the law. You say, well, I don't agree with these laws. Well, sorry. You're not the judge. You're not the one who wrote the laws. You're not the one that enforces the laws. You're not the judge. Whether you like it or not, you are guilty And the sentence, the wages of sin, the sentence, when you're convicted in the courtroom of God's justice, is death, the lake of fire. Or, in our passage here, it says in verse 43 again, To him all the prophets witness that through his name whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. In other words, there's a way for you and I to clear the records Prior to this date, before the judge, and what is that way of doing that? He says that. It says, whoever believes in him will have remission of sins. If I put my confidence and faith, if I commit myself. Now, who is this judge? This judge is the Lord of heaven and earth. This judge is the king of kings. 
This judge is the creator. So it's perfectly right for the creation, that means you and I, to bow down before this individual and simply acknowledge him as Lord and Savior. Now let me say this. It doesn't mean we just mentally acknowledge that. If we believe in him, to believe in him means to be followers, to be disciples. The Bible makes it very clear in James when it says, you believe in God, you do well. Even the demons also believe and tremble. You see, the difference is a lot of unbelievers believe in God. But the demons not only believe in God, but they tremble at the very thought of God. Unbelievers could care less, many of them. I'm simply saying again that we have a way to deal with this prior to that date that God has set. This is the gospel. The gospel message is Jesus is alive. There is a resurrection, both of the living and of the dead. And everyone's going to stand before this individual, Jesus Christ, this person. Nobody else. And everyone has sinned. Everyone is going to be convicted. Everyone has a record of their thoughts, of their words, of their deeds. Every single time they've broken the law, not only with actual uh, actions, but even in thoughts. Jesus said, if you look on a woman to lust, you've committed adultery in your heart. Jesus said, if you're angry with your brother without a cause, you're guilty of murder. So all these things are recorded. All these things convict us. This is the prosecuting attorney. The prosecuting attorney has never lost a case. Ever. Because the record is clear. The evidence is recorded. What are we going to say? How are we going to defend ourselves? We can't. There is no excuse. That's why the Bible says every mouth may be stopped. Every person. There's no argument about this. We're guilty. But if we believe and commit ourselves to the individual who is the judge, he will forgive our sins because the judge served in our place. The judge took the punishment for our sins. All he asks you and I to do is believe in him. To accept him, to be his disciple, to follow him. And if we'll do that, if we'll commit ourselves to a personal relationship, if we'll ask him to forgive us, acknowledge us, don't deny it, don't come say, well, I didn't do that much, or I'm not that bad. No, we come humbly, we come acknowledging our sins, we come saying to the judge, I'm guilty. I'm guilty as charge, but I plead for mercy from the judge. And the mercy, uh, the judge rather basically says, if you believe in me and trust in me and turn from your wicked ways, if you'll repent and follow me, I'll wipe the record clean. Jesus died on the cross. That's what Easter, the crucifixion and the resurrection is all about. Jesus took our place. So this is the gospel. This is what Peter preached to Cornelius. And of course, as he preached, the Bible says the Holy Spirit came upon Cornelius. They were saved. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. They began to speak with tongues. Peter was astonished because the Jews thought only other Jews would be saved at this point and realized, wow, wow God is actually saving people that are not Jews. Yes, God's no respecter of persons. God offers eternal life to whoever will accept Christ. Here's my point again. If you're a non-believer... Are you or are you not guilty before God? Have you or have you not sinned before God? Do we need to go through all the Ten Commandments to prove that you've sinned? For instance, the first commandment is you shall have no other gods before me. If you've ever had any God before him at any point in time in your life, you're guilty. It's like, well, ten years ago I murdered somebody, but I hadn't murdered anybody since. And somehow or another, that's okay. No, it's not okay. The judge has got to deal with that. There has to be justice. So all of us have sinned before God. We have all broken the commandments. We're all guilty. We have to acknowledge that. Secondly, we've got to ask the judge to have mercy and forgive us. We have to say to him, please forgive me. I believe 
that what you did on the cross by shedding your blood and dying in my place satisfies the demand for justice for my sin. The Bible says in Isaiah 53 that God the Father looked down upon the Son. The Bible says, quote, he saw the travail of his soul and was satisfied. That justice has been met for all of our transgressions. But we have to put our trust and faith in Christ. Have you done that? Why have you not done that? Don't you realize that today you're one day closer to that great judgment? Don't you realize that you're risking an eternity in a lake of fire? For what? Just to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a, quote, season? It's not worth it. The judge offers anybody eternal life to whoever will come to him and put their faith in him. There's a way. What did Jesus say? Agree with your adversary quickly while you're in the way. Lest at any time your adversary deliver you to the judge. The judge delivers you to the officer. The officer casts you into prison. What did Jesus say? You'll by no means come out thence till you pay the uttermost farthing. Meaning you've got to pay every single penalty that justice demands. That's just the punishment. That's the penalty. And the penalty is death, eternal death. That's what the Bible says. So let me encourage you, please, if you are not a believer, I would encourage you, as Cornelius and his family did in this 10th chapter, accept Christ. Put your faith in Jesus. Trust him with your soul. Become a disciple. Ask him to have mercy. Ask him to forgive you. Bow your heads and plead with him. I'd like to ask the worship team to come up. Guys, can you come up and we'll close? I'm going to say a prayer, and I would encourage you right now. If Maybe you're not a believer. Maybe you're a young person. You're sitting with your family, and you're wondering, Am I, how do I know this? How do I? Well, let me put it this way. When you, do you, are you uh, confused whether or not you have a relationship with your mom and dad? No, because you talk to them, and you speak with them. You interact with them. Are you confused about whether or not you have friends or not or people that you know? No, because we talk to them. We have a relationship with them. In the same way, our assurance of our salvation is our relationship. The point being is we can go to church, go through all the motions, be raised in a Christian family and home, and really not have a personal relationship. I can't follow the Lord on the coattails of my mom and dad, I am responsible for my actions. That's the whole point. We are accountable for what we do. God will hold everybody accountable for how they act. That's what it means by Jesus being the judge. So let's go before him right now. If you're not a believer or not sure, let's bow our heads. I'm going to say a quick prayer of just repentance and faith in Christ, and I want you If you want Jesus to become your Lord and Savior, if you want to escape the judgment of of God Almighty and know that your sins are washed away and have a personal relationship, let's say this prayer. Let's bow our heads. Jesus, I come to you humbly. You may say this out loud or in your heart. It doesn't make a difference, but please say it from your heart. Lord, please forgive me. I've sinned. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me, that he shed his blood in my place, that he was punished for my sin. Lord, I accept you as my personal Lord and Savior, forgive me. Thank you. Help me to follow you. Help me to get into the Word and learn what it means to really be a disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Let me encourage you, if you did that, please contact the church, email us. You'll see the email 
on our website or our phone number. We'd love to hear from you. We'll be praying that God would bless you. Tell somebody. Tell somebody what you've done. We're going to close with one song. Let me encourage you. Worship the Lord. What a wonderful day this is. God bless you.